I'd like to now introduce our first uh, formal presentation by Joe Doyle. Joe is a friend of mine and a professor of applied economics at MIT Sloan School of Management. He's the faculty director of the MIT Sloan Initiative for Health Systems Innovation and co-chair of the health sector of the Jamil Poverty Action Lab. His research and investigations, his research investigates the source of healthcare value and waste to inform policies aimed at improving the quality and cost effectiveness of the US healthcare system. This includes collaboration with large healthcare providers, payers, uh, community organizations, and he conducts randomized controlled trials to, in, of change in the ways of healthcare delivered with an emphasis on addressing social determinants of health. I always find Joe's presentations to be fascinating and insightful, and I'm confident that, his today, that today's presentation will not disappoint. So Joe, would you please join us? Sure. All right, thanks so much, Jay. Thank you for coming. Um, the, my name's Joe Doyle. I'm a health economist here at MIT Sloan. And the thing that gets me most excited about being at MIT is interacting with our students and other faculty to get out of the ivory tower and actually try to innovate in the real world. There's a lot of talk about innovation. It almost loses its meaning at some point. But the, what MIT is good at, and that's why you're here, is because you know that we try to solve problems in a way that we can then learn why the problem was there in the first place, how do, what were the mechanisms by which we solved it? In this case, can that be applied more generally? And so we get these general lessons that can lead to more and more innovation, this increasing returns to scale. And that's what I want to talk a bit about today. <clears throat> so I'm a health economist, so you have to start with this graph. It's, that, it's like a rule. And that's that we spend a lot of money on healthcare. And so these are different countries from 1970 to 2015. And you can see that we're all around 5 to 10% except for, uh, for one outlier that, of course, is us. A few things that are interesting to me. One is we used to be at the top, but with the pack, and then we've left the pack. And this has been uh, labeled as unsustainable. And so when anything is unsustainable, then things have to change. And what we can bring together is to try to figure out how to change it. Because if we just put in uh, caps on how much we grow healthcare, we're going to lose out on potential value. We have to figure out where waste is and where the value is and, and where to push forward. So we're in the middle, I would call, a healthcare revolution. It's a real, relatively slow revolution. It's like if you're in a car accident and everything moves in slow motion, kind of like that. But there are new payment models um, being developed. Massachusetts at a forefront of trying to change the way we pay for healthcare. And that makes the health economists very excited because we think with the wrong incentives, you get the wrong outcomes. And with the right incentives, you might get the right ones. My engineering friends would then tell me what it takes a lot of work to figure out how to adapt to those uh, new incentives. So we economists can say, change the incentives, and people will figure it out. And the engineers are saying, hey, that's us. We, we are the ones that have to figure it out. So I'm putting the charge to, to people in the audience that can help make it happen. Uh, but there's also been this explosion of data, which economists also love, engineers and economists alike. And that's led to new delivery models. How do we deliver care in new locations, different times, and different ways in order to um, bring more efficiency to the healthcare system. And what gets me most excited, I would say, is trying to address social determinants of health. So that's, and one, just from the data standpoint, if you bring in other parts, not just clinical data, to your predictive models, you're going to improve the quality of those predictive models. Because a lot of the reasons why people are healthy or not doesn't have to do with how they were treated in the past, but how their living circumstances are. So these present new management issues. And we're a management school. And so we can make progress on some of those topics, like how do you get these new data tools, the decision aid tools, for instance, adopted by providers and payers? OK, so I'm the faculty director of the MIT um, Initiative for Health Systems Innovation. So what is that HSI? So many of you know it. Some of you are new to it. Well, we have 25 faculty at MIT Sloan doing work in healthcare. And we, what we want to do is bring that community together and then amplify the impact of their research. So part of that's through fundraising. We're trying to build infrastructure that allows us to get more research done, but all, not only just two more projects, but in a way that can really be scaled. So thinking about scalable interventions and showing what, that they work so the payers will start paying for them, and that's how you get things adopted. That's along a number of different dimensions. So the top there is data analytics. 
lots of work being done on personalized medicine. How do you take genomic information and make um, diagnostic tools out of it? Uh, liquid biopsy, how do you take a blood test for cancer detection? Um, how do you go from image recognition to identifying tumors? So there's a lot of data analytics there. And then the technology, science, and innovation is we have some of the world's leading experts on how innovation happens and why, um, how to encourage more of it. The left there is organization, work, and operations. So that's how do you increase the efficiency of the system and how do you get people to adopt those tools that we're innovating on. And at the bottom there is the finance and economics. So how do you get the right incentives for patients to behave in healthier ways? And how do you get providers to become more cost effective? So get back to our question for today, which is how do we use data analytics to figure out is our healthcare spending worth it? And so one way to think about it is over time. So over time, this is a, a very long historical view from 1700 to 2000. What's the life expectancy at birth? And so you can see, oh, sorry, you can see this dramatic increase in the life expectancy. These are for whites. Um, these are for blacks. And so there is this huge progress over the 1900s and how long people are living. And economists like to put dollar values on this because we have ways of valuing um, extensions of life. We use market data, how much are people willing to pay to improve their life or, or extend it. And so the gain just from 1970 to two, 1998, we put it at a, at a number of 70, $73 trillion. I don't know if you want to trust whether it's $70 trillion, $60 trillion, but what I do know is that there's just enormous value in healthcare, people are willing to pay a lot for healthcare. In fact, it's almost a problem because if we develop a new technology that costs a billion dollars to save some lives, we're gonna wanna pay that. And so we have to think about as we're um, subsidizing um, research, what type of uh, products, if we had our choice to develop, all else equal, we'd wanna do the cost effective ones. But there's just enormous value if you, can, if you can figure out how to improve health, people are willing to pay for it. Sometimes also people say, oh, the economist is up there, He'll talk about the cost, we're spending too much. But actually we think about benefits too, we like benefits uh, and ex life extension. That's why I'm in this research field is to think about how to get people healthier. But of course that story has been taking a, a, a hit lately in part because of things like opioids. So this, this dramatic increase from 2000 to 2017 in terms of the number of, of drug overdoses is uh, staggering. And so if you look at, say, um, people ages 45 to 54, this is just a graph for US, whites in the US, you see this leveling from 1990. Well, it's still coming down, like I showed you, but then it started to go up and, and it's going the wrong direction. And these are other countries. So here's the UK, Germany. Um, they're kind of continuing to go down, but we're going the wrong direction. This is a frightening fact, and partly we get to the social determinants of health that are leading to it. This is a leading hypothesis is that these are, the increase in the deaths are coming from what are known as deaths of despair. So that'd be suicides, overdoses, accidents. And so it's a really sad situation. And so what do we do to try to address it? Well, we could think about the different types of social determinants. So that would be hunger, food insecurity is what we'll have a panel. I'll be moderating a panel in a, a moment uh, later this morning about that. Education, uh, workforce, so are people employed? This is, to me, in health economists, we get very excited about this because it's the social side. We're a social science. And so we feel like we can play a role in this discussion, um, partnering with clinics and clinicians, but bringing in our expertise on the social science side. How do you get people to behave in healthier ways? How do you address their constraints, like their food insecurity or their transportation needs? So there's a lot of research going on now. And like Jay was saying, this is a very hot topic. Payers are starting to be able to pay for. CMS announced in the, those remarks that in 2020, Medicaid Advantage will start to be able to pay for things that address social determinants like food. And then the question is, will people pay for it? They, what they need, I've, I believe, is credible evidence that it works. And this is where MIT and other researchers come in, bringing data to bear on the questions of what works and what doesn't. So another way we can think about whether what works and what doesn't is looking across countries again. And you can see this is total expenditures on healthcare per capita on the x-axis average life expectancy on the y-axis, and you can see that it goes up um, pretty reliably, and then there's this outlier here called the USA. And this is sort of dramatic, and people often point to this and say, look, we could save a bundle of money if we could just get, you know, move here. Uh, just kind of move in that direction. And it's, we'd say, you have to be a little bit careful about that. Where is the waste and where is the value? That's what we have to figure out. So if to do that, we have to be able to measure what I call the returns to healthcare. That's if we invest more in healthcare, do we save lives? 
and is it worth it to, uh, based on those investments. And one way that we can help get saved by this is big data. And I wanted to spend a few slides on thinking about what does it mean to have big data play a role in healthcare. So first of all, EHR adoption, electronic health record adoption, subsidized by the federal government, has exploded in the US. And so back in 2008, um, if you had a basic EHR, it's down here at uh, very few hospitals had a basic EHR with clinical notes attached to them. And now we're at 75, and almost every hospital has a contract to have one of these in place in the future because they were subsidized to get that kind of contract. So this data is becoming more and more available. And at MIT, we're trying to develop the tools to put that into a, a de-identified database in a way that researchers can then uh, study it. So in big data, there are different types of big data. Some are called breadcrumbs. And that means you leave a trail behind you when you just do your everyday life. And the, we're capturing more and more of those breadcrumbs. And how can we use those? So first, providers, these electronic health records that have been subsidized, those are like breadcrumbs. They weren't meant to be used for research. They're used, meant to be used for continuity of care and learning about the patient. But we can mine those data to figure out who will become sick tomorrow. And whether an intervention that's planned, we can then evaluate it through these kind of, kind of data. Scheduling data is interesting to me because it's a choice that people make about whether they're going to show up for their appointments. And so if you can get people to start feeling better about themselves and their social determinants, I expect to see it coming out in fewer no-show rates. We want to see it in behavior. We do survey our patients in my studies, but what I really put my hat on is when people change their behavior. Uh, genomic information banks, organizations um, like Geisinger, who I'm working with, is trying to get 200,000 patients in their genomic information base, using those data then to figure out diagnostic tools and how do you get patients to listen to the information and how do you get providers to use the information are, are hot topics at the moment. But you know, like the 23,000 genes with 6 billion nucleotides, we're going to need some big data tools to figure out how to analyze that type of data. Payers have paid claims. I've used a lot of paid claims data in my life, especially Medicare paid claims. And there is information in there. Um, you get, it's high quality in terms of you, in terms of the payments that are transferred. Because if a check gets written, that gets recorded. Um, but then it also includes diagnoses, procedures, and demographics in a ways that I find predictive if you use them in the right way. There's a lot of noise in that data, and so what you have to do is have a framework that you can apply over it to figure out where the value is in the data. How do you turn data into knowledge? And then all-payer databases. There are some companies like Optum, that's an arm of United Healthcare, linking EHR data with claims data. HECI, which is a healthcare cost institute, um, they have put together from three large insurers data. So these data sets are being created, and they're very valuable. One of the ways that we use them is we pay for them. Another one is that we partner with them to study. And then suppliers, uh, so patient apps. P many people, startups here at MIT are developing an app, but the, the, and they want to know, how do I evaluate the effectiveness of the app? And some of it is in the app itself. Remember the scheduling analogy. If people are, starting, are using the app more, and you can actually see their behavior changing in the app, that's going to be more credible than asking them if they walk more. You just see if they walk more on their phone. And medical equipment has reams of data that's created. And images, for example, are large data sets. And so we're. Uh, collecting these type of data at MIT. Um, just quickly through uh, thinking a bit more broadly, so think about your smartphone has data in it, where you're going, how fast you're moving. Uh, marketing data, so people think about how do you target advertising to people. And here we think, could think about how do we target um, information to people. But when, the, when advertisers do it, they're linking it up with credit card histories and uh, search histories. And that gets, to be honest, a little bit spooky. And people are concerned about the privacy concerns about that. It would be nice to see if, uh, if we can get permission for our pa from patients in order to use this type of data to develop tools to improve uh, the way we deliver healthcare. And then we have lots of other um, types of big data from social media, how often people are emailing, what they're emailing. Um, and then administrative data, which is a trove of data that unfortunately is, lives in different uh, silos that we're trying to work to connect them. So this gets back to the social determinants of health. If you can measure from unemployment insurance data, how much people are working and what their earnings are, then you can get a measure of morbidity in a way that's directly applicable to productivity. Or criminal justice. There's some good evidence that if you get housing stability, um, so if you get homeless people out of shelters and into homes, that you can improve their health. But a big part of that return is actually comes from criminal justice. It's shown, it's shown that through really credible research designs that if you get people adequately housed, then they're not showing up in jails as well as emergency departments. So this, think about those benefits more broadly is what economists like to do. And then there are different machine learning tools that we can apply. So you've probably heard of these before, but the unsupervised tools would 
um, just find natural patterns in the data that we could then use for recommendations of what should we, what should we do. Supervised learning is when we have an outcome we want to hit, and we can just predict it, like who will be sick tomorrow, who will overdose tomorrow. And so that's an amazing tool that you can have. The next step then is to have the intervention that tries to prevent that to happen. And that needs more causal evidence of whether the intervention is working. Now, we've made amazing recent progress in prediction. So it's, we're in the middle of this really amazing exponential growth in the ability of these tools in order to make these predictions much better, especially if there are hidden nonlinearities in the data to begin with. So like I mentioned, we can use that to target messaging, like you should be taking your drug now, or you should be, um, you should be eating uh, your, your vegetables now. Um, guiding clinical decisions with real-time decision aids. So a big question is whether physicians would listen uh, to a decision aid tool when it's provided to them. So how do we get the, um, buy-in from providers to not just ignore the type, the computer's telling me to do something, am I gonna listen to it? And I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Reducing the cost of research through our ability to track these outcomes, creatively thinking about the benefits broadly, for example, and also finding what I call natural experiments, which I'll, I'll be describing at the end of the talk today. Now, why do we use these, these uh, tools? But we can predict who's going to be sick tomorrow, and then we can, if we have a plan to intervene, then that's where we want to be investing our efforts into predicting who's going to be sick tomorrow. And then we want to test whether it works in the, in the field. Um, and one, just one example where physicians have been responsive is drug interactions. So there's so many interactions and they're changing all the time that it's difficult to keep up with all of them. But decision aid tools at the point of prescribing or the point of filling a prescription can reduce the danger that comes with these adverse in events. Also, with all this data from all over the country, you can start to discover which interactions are not healthy. So that's a way that we can learn and also deploy an intervention. And then image recognition, you know, moving from uh, image recognition on the, on the web, if you search for cat, you get the cat pictures to a radiologist using a tool that allows them to identify in an image whether there's a tumor there. That sounds, you know, is inspiring, and that's what a lot of people do here at MIT is trying to perfect those tools. Okay, so the management challenges, we are a management school, so why are we weighing in on clinical evidence? Because there are real management challenges. The first would be provider acceptance. Will providers go ahead and listen to the tools that get created? Alert fatigue is a huge problem, so if you're bombarded with, oh, constantly the computer's yelling at you to do something, then you're going to start ignoring it, and we know that happens. So actually tracing out what the returns are to different levels of alerts and how specific you want them to be and how important you want to flag them is a real area of research that needs, needs more attention. And then cost effectiveness, so if we're constantly monitoring everyone's heartbeat at all times, we don't want to be rushing everybody to the emergency room as every time that somebody takes off their watch. Um, we want the false positives to not be a problem. So obviously this is a, what big data science is all about, is trying to reduce, the, the concern, uh, uh, reduce this false discovery rate to a, a rate that is manageable, but that's a choice variable. And we have to, as a society, think about, well, what's the right false discovery rate that we were willing to, to tolerate? And then the other challenges would be, do people want to share their data? So um, if you have electronic health record data with with hundreds of thousands of patients' data, that's a valuable asset. And so do you want to give it away to a research institution, or do you want to sort of keep it in-house and figure out how you can um, use that data? Partly we may have to pay for that data, partly we might be able to partner um, in collaboratives in a way that um, creates new interventions that are valuable um, downstream. Uh, privacy concerns are a big issue, especially when we think about genomic information. Do we want people to know what might happen to them, pre-existing conditions. You, you might not know you have a pre-existing condition until you um, get the genomic information. And then social and medical data linked, like the credit card data linked with your medical record, that might feel a little uneasy, uh, but do we want that to happen? These are all discussions that we need to have. And then correlation versus causation, which is really what I do as a health economist, is think about how do we break this, um, this spurious correlations and let the data confess what's actually causal in the, in the data. So one idea is to just let the data speak. I hear this on campus quite a bit. And if you think about the, the Google flu, um, so when people are searching for Google for flu on, on Google, that gives, in real time, on that day, you have some sense of where the flu is going to be. And so this is in the, um, the orange is the Google flu, and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, has their own measures, and that but has, comes out in a lag. You're going to find out in a month that there's an epidemic that's already gone. So 
What was nice about Google Flu is that it tracked it very nicely, but you get it on a daily basis. But then at some point, people started searching for the flu for reasons other than that they had the flu. It was like the bird flu or something that came out. And so now, you're, now the model is not predicting well. So it's nice to know why your model is working and why it's not. And maybe you have to refine your model over time and keep that in mind. So sometimes these correlations work for a while and then they stop working. And so it's nice to have a framework actually to think about why your correlations are working so that you can address these types of issues uh, proactively. Here's a data scientist. Um, <laughs> the, the power of data, so holding up graphs actually has a big impact on people. It's like, I'm going to convince you with data. And that finger is the finger of causality, that um, the US homeownership rate dropped because the Obama administration did something horrible. So that's, that's causal. That, that's what, that is what he's saying. Data can be powerful. Let's put it in a slightly different context. So that would be US unemployment. So he didn't hold up this graph. Maybe an uh, Obama administration official would hold up this graph. Look, the finger of causality, look what we did. But you have to be skeptical of this. And the reason is because what if what we call the counterfactual, I'll give you a vocabulary word from my econometrics class, counterfactual. What would have happened in the absence of the policies that were put in by Larry Summers and, and Tim Geithner? So part, it's possible that their policies led to this, and it, if we had a different administration, it would have been much better. That's possible. You can't look at the orange line and know whether they did a good job. It depends on what would have happened with another set of policies. If you ask uh, Larry Summers what would have happened, he would have said this, that <laughs> they prevented the next Great Depression. And so maybe that did happen. And so that would be fantastic. Look at this delta and how much they saved America. So it, it just depends on what that counterfactual is. So let's put it in terms of uh, a healthcare topic. So if we thought about the relationship between treatment intensity and mortality, we'd have treatment intensity on the x-axis and mortality on the y-axis. And so what we want to estimate is some relationship. Like if we spend more on people, do we save their lives? And if you go to, just go to some data, uh, let's see, these are heart attack patients in Florida. X-axis is how much we spend on them. The y-axis is mortality. And so this is what the data looks like. Remember, I'm trying to find that. I have this. I don't care how creative your big data tools are. You're not going to try to figure out if spending more on people actually saves lives when the underlying data just has this hidden what we call endogeneity problem. That there's, and as you, I'm sure, have figured out that if those people are worse health, get more treatment, then it's just going to be hopeless to let the data speak in terms of that underlying endogeneity. We need to know the counterfactual, what would have happened, not just the correlation and the data. So we have to go beyond the correlations. In fact, one of my students sent me this around Halloween, which is it's pretty spooky to think about correlation versus causation. And the point of econometrics is to not stop there. A lot of people stop there and just be like, I am smart. I know the correlation is not causation, and what you said isn't right. But what econometrics does is says we can be even smarter and think about, well, what can we do to get to the counterfactual? And the gold standard, in my opinion, is randomized experiments. This is a way to get to causality. You randomly change the treatment and see if it actually moves the needle in terms of health outcomes. So there's a ton of ex experiments going on in industry, A-B testing. Whenever you look at Google, you might be an ex experiment might be going on to see what your eyeballs do when you see Google in a, in a new light, they run you know, 10,000 experiments a year. And that happens all, all across industry. And here at MIT, at the HSI, and I'm also on the board of the Poverty Action Lab, we do these randomized evaluations in the field. And so one of the, from the Poverty Action Lab, one of our uh, reports we put out, this is on the x-axis, the price that we charge for preventative health care, and the y-axis is take up. And so there are different ones. So here's bed net, so $7 bed net. If you offer it for $3, the take up is you know, 18%. But if you give the bed net away, you're getting, or you get very cheap, you know, 50 cents, you're getting up to 80%. Or here's another bed net example, um, and you can get 80, 90% if you give it away for free. So that, you know, people are very responsive to free and for very low cost, very highly subsidized care. And one question that might come out is, well, then do they use it properly or do they care about it? Maybe they don't value it enough because they haven't paid for it. And that's a real hypothesis and maybe true in some contexts. But in these contexts, the cost sharing didn't appear to concentrate take up on those who are most in need of it. Like everybody, um, if you charge for it, you might think only the people who need it will, will take it, but that didn't, that didn't happen in this case. And there's no evidence that the act of paying for the product makes a recipient more likely to use it. So we can learn these, have these hypotheses and then have different arms of our studies to actually learn deeper about human behavior and whether really paying for something makes people use it. And you find that not only for bed nets, but from a number of other preventative healthcare topics in the developing world. And so the, 
we start to get a body of evidence that helps us convince us that actually this idea that you have to pay for it to value it might not actually be the case. So what we need is credible data, and an RCT, randomized controlled trial, is a good way to get there. So at MIT, I'm working in Camden, New Jersey, for example, where they pointed out that 1% of patients account for 30% of healthcare costs. And so Dr. Jeff Brenner, um, who won a MacArthur Genius Award and was a previous, previous keynote speaker at this conference, um, had sort of spearheaded this idea of hotspotting. So you find out who the most expensive patients are, and then you lavish them with care management, not only for their clinical needs, but for their social determinants of health. And so here, it's very home visit based. There's lots of home visits that go on over a six month period to try to address people's social determinants. But when Jeff Brenner was told that he was, uh, this was a fantastic idea, he's won many awards, he still wanted to know whether the program worked. So he partnered with MIT, and Amy Finkelstein in the economics department and I helped him design a RCT, a randomized controlled trial, where we randomized people into his program and not into his program because they can't treat everyone at once and we could see whether it actually is effective. And so that's the type of rigor that we bring to this otherwise pretty heavy rhetoric area of, you know, we should do better for people that gets a lot of good feeling good, but what we want is credible evidence of what, what works and what doesn't. I'll talk more about this fresh food pharmacy in my panel, but this is a program that provides fresh food to low-income diabetics, and we're about to launch a randomized controlled trial in February as it rolls out to a new city. And so we'll talk a lot more about that in a minute, but you can see this theme. Opioid prescriptions, I'm working with Duke Health to randomize whether these patients see a specialist, an anesthesiologist, to manage their pain. Aurora Healthcare, we looked at a clinical decision support tool where we randomized physicians. Some physicians got the tool, some didn't. And we found that when we gave them advice on what to order, if it said don't order anything, they didn't care, they just ordered it. But if it said, you know, you were ordering a CT scan and actually an MRI score is a lot better on the guidelines, they moved their behavior modestly with just the, inter with just the software, but still, it's a very cheap intervention, very scalable intervention. And so this is coming out in a journal, but the point is not to get one journal article out of it, it's the point is to get a deeper understanding of why, what works and why, in order to get more interventions to be taken up. I partnered with United Healthcare to randomize who we pay to get their wellness visits. So forget about co-pays, this is a negative co-pay. We're gonna pay people to go to their wellness visits. How much do you have to pay? How long do you have to pay? These are things we can answer with a randomized controlled trial. But randomization has its limits. So there's internal validity within the United Healthcare context. I'm going to be able to nail an answer. What's the effect of offering people $25 to go for a wellness visit? And we're gonna see what's the effect of that on their um, family getting their wellness visits. Are there complementarities? Where do we target the, those incentives? I can learn about that very well internally. But then does that apply to other countries? Does it apply to other states, other payers, other types of patients? That's where you get into trouble when you start extrapolating. Maybe we need more experiments, or maybe we need to learn more fundamentally about human behavior in a way that can then apply across, uh, across groups. So to get around this external validity problem that it's usually we worry that it might not apply more broadly, we can go to the big data. We can get data and start thinking about um, what we call natural experiments. So like I said, we can think about, we want some morbidity measure, like how fast someone walks up the stairs. We can start measuring outcomes by uh, seeing these breadcrumb data of how fast they're walking. And we can use that in these natural experiments. So for example, I was interested in whether if you go to Mass General Hospital or a community hospital, how much better outcomes do you get? Or do you get better outcomes? Mass General Hospital is much more expensive than a community hospital, do, do they get better outcomes? And in fact, if you look in the data, it doesn't really matter where you go for a heart, if you have a heart attack, whether you go to a fancy teaching hospital or to a community hospital, after six months, they have the same outcomes. It's just in the data. But the problem gets back to that endogeneity problem that people don't randomly go to hospitals the more severe um, heart attacks might be rushed to the teaching hospitals. So what we need is a shifter, a natural experiment. Some people just happen to go to MGH, some people happen to go to the community hospital. And so what we discovered is, in the Medicare claims data, you know which ambulance picks up the patient. And ambulances, we know from the data, have preferences of where they take patients. Maybe they came from the community hospital. Maybe they come from the fire department and they always go to the closest hospital. So within neighborhoods, we can compare people who are randomly assigned to an ambulance company which shifts them to which hospital they go to. And now we have a randomized shifter of which hospitals people go to, and we can think about what hospital characteristics get the best outcomes. And it turns out that the effect of going to a fancy teaching hospital is gigantic, that it's much better to go to a fancy teaching hospital with a heart attack than a community hospital that you don't see in the raw correlation. You need to have some way to trick the data to get mimic a randomized experiment, a natural experiment. 
And we can also compare in New York State people who get sick just across boundaries of ambulance pickup areas, and you get a similar type of, a different type of variation, but it's still through the ambulance, and you get similar results. That the ambulance company, if you live just across the street from someone who's getting picked up by an ambulance that takes them to a fancy teaching hospital, and your side is taking you more to the community hospital, you get better outcomes. I'll leave you with uh, one more example of a big data tool, which is a continuous measure of, of, uh, of health, which is, say, birth weight. This is from 1350 to 1650. This line is at 1,500 grams. That's a very low birth weight threshold, which is about three pounds, five ounces. OK, it's very, very, lo very low birth weight. And you can see that as you get lighter, we spend more on you. We're spending 85,000. But as you cross this threshold, you get about $95,000 worth of care. And so we're still spending a lot of people, a lot on people who are born at 1501, but you get this discrete jump. It's a, dis a discontinuous jump. What we'd see is that we also get a discontinuous jump in mortality. It falls at the same time. And because these patients are essentially identical in terms of their underlying health risk, we get some people are randomly assigned to more treatment, and then we can identify the effects of that treatment by looking at outcomes. And this, to me, is pretty convincing when you get large and large data sets to look at discontinuities. And we can use big data tools to search for those discontinuities. It's a very hot area of research. I'll leave you with this graph, which is on the x-axis is the age and months, and the y-axis is deaths per 100,000 person years. And it's coming down as you're 19, 19 and a half, 20 years old, your motor vehicle accident death rates come down. But as soon as you turn 21, boom, you get this big jump in mortality because you can now drink publicly and you can go to bars and you can drink and drive. So when I tell people, like students at high schools or something, don't drink and drive, that's one thing. But by showing the finger of causality now is coming in at this much more credible source of variation, if you're just a month before your 21st birthday, you're pretty much the same level of driving ability and everything else. The only thing different is that people are drinking and driving more when they turn 21. And so we can characterize that as uh, a real life message of not to drink and drive. So I'm going to leave you with food for thought, especially since I'm going to have a panel on food in a minute. Um, but management lenses for healthcare problems is what we do at HSI. We'd love to partner with you on that. There's a huge value potential. And big data combined with these tools to get to causality is the way that we can leverage data in order to get to better answers. So what I would like to do is um, introduce also Howard Zucker, who is the commissioner of New York uh, State um, Department of, of Human Services. And um, when he, we talked, he's a visionary of what, how can we change healthcare. And I was saying that's exactly what we want to do, is we want to put a charge to the people in our audience to help innovate. And I think you're going to get that vision now. So thank you all for your time, and thank you for coming.